carbon-13 NMR is both a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing on the one hand because we have an NMR method for carbon, the most important element in organic molecules, but it's a curse because carbon-13 is not the dominant isotope of carbon, and for a couple of other reasons that we'll see in the remainder of this video. In fact, carbon-13 is so rare that if you were to take a block of carbon and separate out its carbon-12 and other isotopes in carbon-13, what you'd find is that the vast majority of the sample is carbon-12. Something like 99% would be carbon-12, which is an NMR inactive nucleus. In other words, a non-magnetic nucleus in the terminology we've used previously. And only 1% of that is the magnetically active carbon-13. And so we're facing sensitivity issues already since only 1% of our sample is NMR active. We also discussed earlier the idea that carbon is less intrinsically sensitive than the hydrogen nucleus is to an applied magnetic field, and so the energy splitting for carbon relative to hydrogen is much smaller. It's about one-fourth, and this limits our sensitivity as well since the energy gap gets smaller for carbon than it is for hydrogen. Even so, because carbon is such an important element to organic molecules, carbon-13 NMR is a routinely applied technique. And now with the advent of pulsed NMR spectroscopy, which cut down on signal acquisition times, carbon-13 NMR has become practically viable where it wasn't before in the continuous wave era. In addition to the abundance and intrinsic sensitivity issues, carbon-13 has the added problem of coupling strongly to attached protons. And that's going to be an issue in any organic molecule that has a CH bond, which is pretty much almost everything, right? To address this, we actually sidestep the issue completely in the vast majority of cases by decoupling proton resonances from carbon resonances. This means that carbons appear as singlets, since coupling to hydrogens is taken away completely, and because carbon-13 is so rare, the odds of carbons coupling to each other is essentially nil. And this is actually worth thinking through, right? If there's a 1% chance of a carbon-13 nucleus existing here, and a 1% chance of a carbon-13 nucleus existing here, then the chances of two carbon-13 nuclei being bound to each other are extremely tiny, right? And so we don't observe coupling of carbon nuclei in carbon-13 spectra. So all our signals are singlets. As it turns out, the chemical shift scale for carbon-13 NMR is much wider in a chemical shift sense than the scale is for proton NMR. In the vast majority of cases, it runs from about 0 ppm for the most shielded of carbons, in other words, the most electron-rich of carbons. The intuition here is the same as it is in proton NMR spectroscopy, up to about 200 at the high deshielded end of the range. Around 0 ppm is typical for alkyl protons, for example, CH3, CH2, etc. And on the highly deshielded end, among the most deshielded carbons are carbonyl carbons that we find in the CO double bond. In carbon-13 NMR spectra, carbon signals appear as singlets, and we just emphasized the reasons why. Carbon-13, carbon-13 coupling is a non-issue, and CH coupling is turned off through broad irradiation of all of the protons with their resonant frequencies. And so we only see singlets in a carbon NMR spectrum. In the next video, we'll talk about how we distinguish between quaternary carbons lacking hydrogens and those that possess hydrogens through a special technique called depth spectroscopy. You also often see a solvent peak in these spectra since deuterated chloroform, which has no hydrogens but does have carbons, can contain an NMR active carbon-13 nucleus, and it splits into kind of a weird-looking triplet because of the magnetic properties of the chlorine nuclei. As in the proton NMR correlation chart, in the carbon NMR correlation chart, the electronegativity of nearby atoms and atoms bound directly to the carbon is important, and inductive effects of nearby atoms are also important. Because the carbons are in different positions than the hydrogens in aromatic rings and alkynes, the ring and pi current effects that we discussed for proton NMR are somewhat different here than in the proton NMR case. Here we find, for example, aromatic carbons a little bit upfield of plain vanilla alkene carbons. However, alkyne carbons benefit from ring current shielding just as terminal alkyne protons do, as evidenced by this difference. Aside from this, you should notice patterns in chemical shift that are consistent with our intuition about how electronegativity works, for example, with 
CO carbons appearing downfield of saturated alkane carbons. That said, non-bonding lone pairs can start having weird effects on carbon chemical shifts, weird through space effects, and this is one reason why we see, for example, CCL and CI resonances in the same region as CH saturated alkane resonances. The lone pairs are playing a shielding role for these carbons. Because carbon-13 NMR spectra don't contain any coupling information, they really can't give us any information about how carbons are connected within an organic structure, and that's a limitation of carbon-13 NMR. At the same time, we can use it as a reinforcement of, or in many cases a replacement for, functional group information that would come from an infrared spectrum. And we can also get information through either 2D or depth spectra about how many hydrogens are connected to each of the carbons in a carbon-13 NMR spectrum. Here the infrared spectra and the carbon-13 NMR spectra for the molecules shown here, which is methyl methacrylate. The IR spectrum indicates clearly the presence of a carbonyl group in this molecule, and we see a downfield peak that indicates the presence of a carbonyl group as well, and in fact both of these, with a little bit more care, we can identify with an ester functional group. Drawing the usual 3,000 wave number dividing line in the IR spectrum, we do see some character associated with sp2 CH stretches, and these are reinforced by the presence of alkene carbons in the carbon-13 NMR spectrum. Just from these considerations, we've identified what are really the two key functional groups in this molecule, the alkene, or carbon-carbon double bond, and the ester, carbonyl group attached to an oxygen with an alkyl group attached. Although the carbon-13 NMR spectrum may seem somewhat redundant with the NMR spectrum, I would encourage you not to discount it. One advantage of the carbon-13 NMR spectrum is that it has no fingerprint region. The entire range of the spectrum is useful to interpret, and so visually, in my personal opinion, this makes it a little bit easier to work with than the infrared spectrum.